ओम अखंडमंडलाकार व्याप्त येन चराचर तत्पद दर्शिद येन तस्म श्रीगुरव नम अज्ञानतिरांद से ज्ञानाजन शलाकय चक्षुर्मीत येन तस्म श्रीगुरव नम गुरूर्ब्रह्म गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुर्देव महेश्वर गुरुसाक्षात्ब्रह्म तस्म श्रीगुरव नम हाँ सो टुडे वी आर सपोज टू हैव अ डायलॉग um not a question answer session but a dialogue um to make it easy i asked for questions i think there are about sahasrara questions here <laughs> <laughs> all in sits hmm? so what i'll do at random i will pick up some and we'll do as much as we can that's all we can do right I just we can there's a young man who asked me some question just now so I'll also add that along with this uh huh so now which box to pick here or here <laughs> what is the box now please give me the liberty to not read a question if it is not relevant are you going to stand for elections if <laughs> how to know the identity of one's ishta devata now this question is only one sentence but it requires a background to understand ishta devata ishta means what you are interested in what you like ishta ishta means yeah ishta no bag ah uh. see ishta in malayalam also means that means something you like and devata you know the divinity so in our ancient culture and spiritual teachings the supreme brahman the supreme being can manifest in different forms or can remain formless there is no contradiction in this matter some people prefer to look at divinity as a form as an idea sometimes as an abstract but it's still i trying to look at it what it is nobody can define but since it is so vast sometimes you need a symbol or a sound or an image and rishis who in ancient times have meditated have seen the manifestations of the divine in some forms these forms they have given to us and depending on the background and which particular form if you like forms you can also have an ishta without form this is something which people don't think of you can think that i am i love that supreme being who is in my heart who is the spark of the divine then that becomes your ishta however there is an advantage in having uh someone with form and so on because then you can relate so therefore all this has been formulated before we go into this you don't mind if one question takes some time because it may answer some other questions even if i'm not picking them up um <clears throat> many years ago there was another m who wrote the gospel of ramakrishna <clears throat> so he was uh, like you and me a married man mm-hmm. was a headmaster of a school um uh, generally he got free only on sundays he was busy one day it happened which happens to all married people he had a fight with his wife hmm. can anybody say we have never fought husband and wife i'm a married man hmm. so one day he got very upset and disgusted and then he got into a chat of you know those buggies horse buggies and i'm going somewhere so one of his friends told him look if you are feeling very upset there is a nice garden of rasmani 
Rani Rashmani in Dakineshwar. You can go and spend some time there quietly. Uh, the garden was well looked after at that point, okay? Not like now. So, also, there is a chance that you might meet a Paramahamsa. Now, M belonged to the Brahmo Samaj. So, he was not interested in Paramahamsas and all that. You know, in those days, it was a fashion of what we call young Bengal to become part of the Brahmo Samaj, the supreme Brahman uh, God and no form and all that. So, <coughs> even Swami Vivekananda at one time was part of the Brahmo Samaj. <coughs> so, he said, I'm not interested in all this. Okay. Now, as destiny would have it, <coughs> No, no, destiny or plan. Just when he was passing through Dakshineshwar's gardens, the axle broke. Hmm. So what to do? He got down and went to the garden. There was a bench there. He sat on it. It's a nice place. Then somebody came towards him. This person... We have seen only the pictures of Ramakrishna Paramahamsa in the later times when he had a beard and all that. Some earlier pictures, he's clean shaven. It's a very shining face. Uh, and it was winter, so he was wearing black uh, bandhagala on top of his white kurta and a beautiful red bordered Bengali dhoti. You know, it's so long that you have to put part of it into your pocket. And nice polished jutis, brown jutis. Somebody came. And the lips were red because he just had lunch and a pan. He came to him and sat down near him. So I asked him, I heard there is some Paramahamsa living here. Do you know anything? He said, I don't know really. <laughs> but let's have a chat. So he sat down. How do you recognize a Paramahamsa when he doesn't advertise that he is a Paramahamsa? Lesson to be drawn. Anyway, so he sat down and they fell into a conversation. Uh, suddenly he asked him, Oh, so uh, do you believe in God with form or without form? M said without form. Brahma Samaj, without Okay, so you are God without form? He said, fine, that is great. You are Rishis of worship, the Supreme Brahman. Um, this God of yours has a special place where he lives or is he everywhere, all pervading? He's everywhere, all pervading. Okay. In that case, he said, there is a temple there. You see there? There is a mother goddess image there. If your God is everywhere, he must be inside that image also. You cannot say, no, it's not there, only other other parts. There? Yes, it must be there. Then why don't you worship? <laughs> he just kept quiet. He didn't want to answer. He thought, what is this? Silly. And he went away. So if you think the Supreme Being is that great formless expanse, fine, that is true. So say the Upanishads, so say people who have found it. But if that is also there everywhere in all images, and if you love an image and worship, you can worship the being there also. Such worship is called the worship of the Ishta Devata. <coughs> the story doesn't stop there because he went off and he said to himself, I'm not going to come here again. Then once in the evening, on a Sunday, Thakur was sitting in that room next to the temple where all the tamasha used to happen every day. All the boys sitting there. In fact, many people said this Brahman priest, he's spoiling these young boys. They're not going to college. They're coming and sitting here. And what does he teach them? Jokes. Gives them rasagulla to eat. Anyway, so... Thakur told them about a story of a priest in a temple 
who used to mix opium in the milk. Seat, you, there is a seat, you can always sit down. Here, here. No. If you are standing, it's okay. If you love to stand, that is your ishtam. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, they, uh, yeah, what did I say? The priest used to mix opium in the milk and give it to others and the rest would be left in a bowl. So, in the campus one peacock used to come. Uh, dangerous story to say because I get some email saying I am the peacock. <laughs> <laughs> peacock came one day and drank the milk with the opium. It was so happy and pleased that every day at that time the peacock used to come. And then after saying the story, he said to somebody sitting near him, a peacock will come now. I thought maybe some peacock is coming, who knows. And Thakur sometimes says things which you cannot understand. He just dismissed it. Like One minute later, M walks in. So, Thakur whispers to somebody sitting near, the peacock has come. <laughs> So, as soon as he enters the room, everybody bursts into laughter. He doesn't know why they are laughing. <laughs> anyway, he can't ask, so he sits down, satsang, everything is over. And then finally, when he is leaving, he asks one of the boys, What is, why did you laugh? Do I look like a joker? Why are you laughing when I came? They told him this was the story. He said, The peacock will come, and we were thinking he's saying some non something which we can't understand. And then you came and you said, the peacock has come, this is why. So he laughed. And then he became the peacock. Every Sunday he used to come and sit. Instead of wasting time somewhere else, he used to come and listen to everything. After some time it appeared that Thakur has accepted him as a biographer. Because while talking about something, suddenly he asked him, did you note that down? So, so officially declared. So this is the gospel of Ramakrishna. So why I said this is about Ishta Devata. That was the question. So the Ishta can be also the Supreme Brahman, the Ishta can also be a form or a shape which you which the Rishis have had visions of the divine manifestations and given to us. So there is something in it. Plus, it's not so easy to fix your attention on some very um, uh, abstract, at least in the beginning, is not possible. Uh, so, we all live name and form. Nama Rupa is a common factor in our lives. If I see you, your form, I know your name. Or if I hear your name, I know this is the person, the form. So the Nama and Rupa are linked to each other. We live our lives like that. Oh, don't tell me we don't, because morning as soon as you wake up, what do you do? When you go to brush your teeth, usually there is a mirror. We are so much in love with our own face, our own Rupa, that you look closely, one hair has gone grey. Okay. Hair is growing out of the nose, I have to snip it. You see, so we are so fond of our own forms. And yet we like to say the form, they say, uh, <coughs> not saying that you should not look at this divine being. It is, of course, all pervading and so on and so forth, but it's easier to fix your attention on something which is related to you in some way with name and form. So therefore, many ishtas have been given by the great rishis who had them in their visions. Some of them are the great manifestations of the divine who have lived on earth and some may be those who have not lived on earth also. Um, <clears throat> even those who do not belong to the Dasa Avatara uh, list may also be Ishtadevatas. Shiva doesn't belong to the 
avatara list, dasa avatara list. But Shivam is from ancient times worshipped as a symbol of the divine, as the god of regeneration. Destruction is regeneration. And as the innermost Atma, Pidananda Rupaha Shivoham Shivoham is from the Nirvana Shataka. So, the easiest way to worship Shiva, if you, if you have Shiva as an Ishta, is as a Linga, so there is no form. Otherwise, every time you paint Shiva, it is different. Some Shivas have moustache, some are clean shaved. Linga solves all that problem. Yes. So, <clears throat> so the development of that connection between you and the Divine, the question here is how to identify one's Ishta. You have to look at it carefully, discuss with somebody who knows, and then decide what is your Ishta. And once you have decided, don't keep shifting. Don't be like a college student. One day this girl is, I'm in love, then the other day I'm in love. You stay with one. Yeah? Can what? Your Ishta may not necessarily... Oh, yeah, you say, can you consider your parents? The only problem here, while you, it is a wonderful thing to do, is that you will see some human traits in your parents. You see? If you see human traits in your parents, then it interferes with your worshipping the Divine. That is the only problem. You can do seva to their, your parents, saying that they are manifestations of the Divine. But for meditation purposes, it's good to have an Ishta Devata. Yeah. Where there are no human traits visible. The Divine traits visible. Krishna looks very human in many ways, but he transcends all human characteristics. Somebody said, uh, somebody wanted to marry again. and then, Why? I said, why? Because Krishna had 16,000 wives in Dwaraka. I said, well, but in all these places, can you be at the same time? No, then you can. Then you. <laughs> huh? Look, if you are pure in heart and pure in mind, and if you want only spiritual development, then it doesn't matter which form of... You can even worship a cow or a goat or a... Or a in India, though, even Varaha is an avatar. Right? So it doesn't matter. So if, as long as you're pure, you will not be distracted, even if it is some astral entity. It doesn't matter. So the main thing is, Fix on one after a great deal of thought. Don't be in a hurry. And once you have fixed, try and approach someone who is worshipping or who is connected to that deity in some way. Then they will be able to give you a mantra which is related to your Ishta. If your Ishta is Krishna, you cannot say, I am going to chant Om Namah Shiva. Right? If your Ishta is Shiva, you can't say Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudeva. It doesn't click, it clashes. So, better to go to a person who knows about it and ask them, discuss with them and then decide your Ishta. And once you have decided your Ishta, take a mantra. Ishta mantra, it's called an Ishta Devata. Now, once you have done that, how to meditate on that? Have the Ishta in your heart or in your between the eyebrows, the image, and chant the mantra which has been given to you. That's all you need to do. But already I have deal one person's question, if everybody starts asking again on the same, how do we go to the next question? Ha, huh, ask. Devi and Sunya. So, how it is related to Ishta Devata, like 
No, this is because certain families from ancient times have decided that this is the Rishta, the Kula Devta. So, if it doesn't, if you don't agree with this, there is no necessity that you should take the same Ishta. You can change. But you don't have to show any disrespect to the Kula Devta. That's how you can solve that problem. Hmm? Guru can be an Easter. Who asked this question? <laughs> um, yes, but it has some dangerous uh, problems. It has to be a true Guru, a real, otherwise it will, you will run into wrong places, wrong things, wrong paths. Huh? If the Guru is pure and is not interested in anything other than your spiritual welfare, then there is no harm in treating the Guru as uh, your Ishta Devta. But it's always good to have one Ishta and the Guru because there is the Guru Mantra which is not the Ishta Mantra and there is the Ishta Mantra which is not the Guru Mantra. So I would suggest instead of having a human being as a uh, now, if you see somebody and if you are fully convinced that there is no other divine being who you have in this life seen who is as good as this good teacher that you have, then there is no harm in turning that into your Ishta Devta. Example, when the Belur Math was set up, Swami Vivekananda said, all other deities I might have seen in my mind in a vision or it might have been described in some texts. But the only living divinity I have seen is Ramakrishna. So let's worship him in the temple. So the Ishta Devata and Guru all both are, as far as the Ramakrishna movement is concerned, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. Now it is rare to have such, such, this is the problem. Not so easy. How do we understand? <laughs> if you are a lady, make sure he doesn't ask you every day, I want to come and see you. <laughs> One sign of a genuine teacher. <laughs> Whether he wants to lead you to spiritual progress or he wants to take something out of you instead of giving you. Hmm? And also watch, if there is humility, uh, if no humility is present in a human being or a great soul, then that is not a great soul. No spiritual teacher will be an arrogant kind of, uh, you go, to, I want, uh, suppose I, I want to touch your feet. And there are two ways to If you are too tired, you can say, can we do it tomorrow? Don't worry. Because the person has feeling. Instead of that, get out, something. Don't touch me. You see what I mean? So you have to watch for these qualities. And if you see somebody for one hour sitting here in the mic, you cannot really understand that person. You see that person many times before you find out what kind of a person that is. If he is Sarvatra Samabuddhaya, which means at all times if the mind remains tranquil, then such a teacher is worthy of worship. Hmm? Now shall we move to the next? Now did I put this back here? My God, there are so many questions. This question I am going to read because it is very poetic, nicely put. My yoga teacher and friend, 
I means this yoga teacher you are talking about, you also consider as your friend. Okay, good. Says, my condition is like an intoxicated monkey climbing a pole which has been heavily oiled. <laughs> Very poetic. Huh? Uh, I just move up and down the pole. <laughs> Sometimes my practice goes well, but at times I just go out of practice. Kindly guide me. So, that my condition is like an intoxicated monkey. I can understand this. The mind is so tricky that one day it will take you up, the next day it will bring you down. So the question is, oh, how can, what can we do to keep it steady and not... Sometimes the practice is good. I have to tell you this. This path, if you choose the spiritual path, it's not an easy thing. You have to understand this. Why? Because most people are swimming with the stream. One person stands up and says, I want to swim against the stream. It's not easy. It is difficult. Let's accept the fact that it is difficult. If there is a uh, heavily oiled pole or not, it is very difficult. Hmm? And Therefore, you need to put all your attention to the path. It cannot be a hobby. It has, if you need to reach, if you are happy with a little bit of meditation, carry on, that's all fine. But if you want to actually travel on the spiritual path, you have to have that as your first priority. It cannot be a hobby. When I say first priority, that doesn't mean you should retire to some ash. That's not what I'm saying. In your mind, you should understand that it is the most important thing. And I'm going to put all my energy and work towards it. It is also, even if you do that, it's also very common that sometimes you will slip down. In spiritual life, nobody has progressed without slipping and falling down. A few times or a little more number of times. We can't say that, depending on the person's state. So, when you fall down, you should not say, Oh, now it is done, gone, lost. You should get up again and move forward. If you find the pole oil too much, get a nice dry cloth and wipe it clean. <laughs> Don't give up. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you used an expression, intoxicated monkey. That monkey part is not so good, but that intoxicated is very good word. If you get more and more intoxicated in your spiritual path, if your spirit gets intoxicated, not the bottled spirit, that is also spirit, and it gets intoxicated, then the movement will be automatic. You don't have to worry about it. Even there, you may go sometimes to a great height and then fall down. When you fall down, you should get up, dust away the uh, dust which is on your bumps and begin to climb again. There is no other way out. Of course, if you have the blessings of a true spiritual teacher, it may be made easier for you. At least, he will encourage you not to be discouraged by the fall and say, okay, I have also passed through this. We need to move forward. And believe me, the greatest of sadhaks have gone through this. It's not as if it's an exception. The greatest of sadhaks have gone through this. <clears throat> Even he has gone through Even his guru Ramakrishna Paramahamsa has gone through this. There were times when he was down and out and he used to pray to the mother, what has happened, why are you not visible to me? This is normal, in, so don't give up. That's the only advice I can give. Hmm? 
keep practicing. One day it will happen. I am telling you. I worked hard myself. Babaji was there, but he made me work very hard. Don't take it easy was a thing always on his tongue. Don't take it easy. <coughs> now here's a question. Sometimes I feel grace and blessings on me. Whatever I am thinking or wanting happens. Is that really a blessing? But whatever I think happens. Make sure that sometimes what you want may not be what you actually need, especially on the spiritual field. So it's not such a nice situation that you always get what you want. It's not such a foolproof situation. So, question is, what do I need to make sure that I don't lose this and continue on the journey? Now, on the journey to the truth, you have to keep working on it and not give up. That's the only way possible. There are no shortcuts, unfortunately. Yes, people say if the Guru's grace is there, yes, I understand. The thing is, even we don't allow the Guru's grace to come to us because we keep all our windows shut. It's not as if there is no grace. Grace is everywhere available. But our doors and windows are all sealed. Grace is like this beautiful fragrant breeze that blows. But if your windows are closed, how will it come inside? Okay. Since it's a gentle breeze that blows, do I have any control over when it comes? No. It will come when it wants. I cannot say you should come now. It will come when it wants. But what can I do? I can keep the windows open. I can keep the floor clean. Otherwise, when the breeze, even the best breeze can bring dust from the floor to you. These things I can do, which is called sadhana. So, once you understand this, then you are also patient. You wait for the breeze to blow, but keep your windows open. All sadhana is only opening your windows. There is nothing more than that. You cannot control that grace. But it is there. It will come. So, one day when you are desolate, nothing, it is all gone, I am a hopeless case, I give up. You are sitting there, windows open. One day the breeze will blow, a fragrant breeze, and you'll smell it, you'll open your eyes. It's like the first raindrops that fall after a terrible summer. You know how it feels? But that summer is required for you to feel that falling of the raindrops. So, we all go through it. I forgot to bring my glasses. Even yogis need reading glasses after 70. Uh, what power is that? 1.25. I don't want anything. I am read it like this. Thank you. I am a 22-year-old law student. This is a dangerous law. Mm. I, uh, I am studying Dzogchen. Is that so? Is that the word? Huh? Yeah, Dzogchen tradition, uh, taking initiation into Sri Vidya very soon. Sri Vidya has nothing to do with Dzogchen. Anyway, I am also studying Siddha Siddhanta Paddhari. My question is about these three parts, since you have walked them, is the fruit of Dzogchen, 
and samavasya of the nats the same is my intuition correct and thank you no i need to tell you that we we'll discuss this uh there seem to be two traditions which you are trying to bring together here one you are talking about jokchen and then you are talking about sri vidya and then you are reading the siddha siddhanta paddhati of the nath sampradaya which of course goraknath magnum opus um and then the question you asked is samavasya of the nath the same as the jokchen so you must understand that jokchen is one of the most ancient traditions of tibet even before padma sambhava went and even before other buddhist teachers shantarakshita went they had a movement religious movement spiritual movement called the bom pass the bom pass tradition is where jokchen originated today you cannot find them because they are kind of integrated with the buddhist the bom pass the different buddhist orders they have integrated but some of the teachings of jokchen which were very good jokchen also means the instant part was taken over by padma sambhava and introduced into the vajrayana buddhism so today uh, the jokchen used to have their own monasteries but then later on they became kind of integrated with the buddhist teachings and like in the buddhist teachings since you are jokchen since in the buddhist teachings there is one spiritual leader of a particular sect who keeps coming again and again in the same way they are called rimpoche when you say rimpoche it means precious jewel that's what it means and usually given to reincarnated lamas who claim that they have reincarnated now the jokchen also has a rimpoche who used to live in northern tibet after the chinese came he went away from there and now the jokchen rimpoche lives in the south of india in a place called kollegal near mysore but in tamil nadu border so the rimpoche lives there now also some people have this wrong impression that a lama means a celibate monk and it means so a lama simply means a religious person who is wearing a robe he may be married he may not be married the jokchen rimpoche is a married man with a family but he wears the robes uh i met him nice man he was in kollegal now the teachings of jokchen cannot be stated in narrative ways but true stories i will so to give you one or two stories of the jokchen teachings before we come to why you asking for whether samavasya is the same and so on there was a, a, a disciple of a jokchen teacher who was a disciple for 13 years So every year he used to ask his master nothing has happened to me no jokchen i've been here with you for so many years It went on for 13 years one day they were walking on the road he was walking the master was on the horse again he asked him this question 13 years master i've been with you no jokchen for me what do i do am i wasting my time so the master said he removed a big sack you know what is a sack bag thai from his saddle and gave it to him big one and he said a lot of broken rocks here fill it up so he filled it up he said keep filling it up so it became this high and very heavy said tight 
tied it and he's wondering what is this to do with Dzogchen. <laughs> tie it, tie it, put it on your shoulders. Okay, Master. You see that hill there? Yeah, climb up the hill. It was so heavy even to hold it, but he had to climb the hill with it. So he climbed the hill with great difficulty, almost on the verge of death. He climbed up the hill and reached the top. Master had already reached the top, not by levitating on the horse. <laughs> she was already standing there. So when this guy reached there, he is wondering what is the next instruction because he cannot bear it anymore. This is, what shall I do, Master? Then he said, throw it down. So he threw it down threw it down and he saw just one tree there with shade. Threw it, went and sat under the tree, took a deep breath of relief. Ah, then he said, I got it. Blocked in. Which means, till now he was carrying so much burdens, physical and mental. At one shot, everything was thrown off and he knew what is Dzogchen, what is freedom. It is Dzogchen. Now, you said Siddha Siddhanta Paddhari, Goraknath's teachings. In the Goraknath's teachings, Samavasya is also another word used in Yoga Shastras for Samadhi or more than Samadhi, uh, um, not moksha, kaivalya, kaivalya. Now, it is the same word used and it is the same as what they call Dzogchen, experience. These are only word differences. Now, from how this has got into the Sri Vidya connection is what I am trying to figure out. Neither in the Goraknath's teachings of, nor in the Dzogchen is there any mention of Sri Vidya. So whereas Sri Vidya entered into this picture is something little bit, I am intrigued by it. Um, I think it's better to follow one system and not divert here and there. You will attain the aim of that, if you follow it thoroughly, instead of moving this way, that way. Now, since you mentioned Sri Vidya, Sri Vidya is a mantra path which uses a mantra with Bijaksharas. Bijaksharas are seed sounds which may not have a meaning as such, but has a sound effect on your system. Vidya is knowledge, Sri Vidya is the Devata, the Supreme Devi worshipped as the Goddess of Vidya. Sri Vidya is supposed to take you beyond the ordinary Vidyas and take you to the Super Vidya of understanding that the Devi resides in you, in your heart as Parashakti and in its quiet, complete tranquility it's not different from Shivam the Supreme. So, what we do in Kriya is called the Yoga Tantra and what Sri Vidya is, is the Mantrayana. It is used basically as a technique of chanting certain syllables set up in certain order for a particular period of time till they awaken the energies inside you. I mean, this is Sri Vidya. Um, that's all I can tell you about this. So, if you are going to ta take initiation into Sri Vidya from somewhere, I don't know where, you said you are going to. So be careful that you don't mix everything up and make a khichidi out of it. Granted that Sri Vidya, if properly understood and taken from the right person, can have 
a fast effect of moving you towards the goal. Having said that, one has to be careful because nowadays Sri Vidya is given on internet. What will you do? Sri Vidya can be only given person to person. You cannot internet Sri Vidya. Adi Shankara himself was a Sri Vidya Upasaka. So, that's all I want to discuss of this question. I'm not going to talk about the Bijakshara of Sri Vidya. Now. This question has come from the same source. Two questions from one person. Anyway, <laughs> since it is to do with the sun, I should not neglect it. My son is ten year old. Upanayanam has been done for him. He is irregular with his sandhya. How regular are you with your son? <laughs> Especially <laughs> Pratha Sandhya, morning Sandhya, as he has to go to school early in the morning. So we are trying to make him do Gayatri Mantra ten times. Can we add Hamsa to this practice? Secondly, how can a ten-year-old kid be educated with, to benefit of Sandhya or practice such as Hamsa? Like, it's always beneficial to chant the Gayatri if you have no time to do the entire Sandhya Vandana for him, he can at just chant the Gayatri at least a few times in the morning. The, many, the very meaning of the Gayatri Mantra, the last sloka, last sentence is Dio Yohna Prajodayat. May my intelligence be stimulated. So it certainly will be effective to chant Sri Vidya, especially for a growing young boy who is going to school and learning things, it will definitely help. Whether you want to add Hamsa to this, if he is 10 year old, he can do the Hamsa, which we discussed in the morning. There is no harm. But if you are doing it, it should be done after the Gayatri. First the Gayatri is to be chanted a few times and then you can sit down and do and it definitely benefit him his, his intellectual development and ultimately take him to the spiritual path. It's interesting that most of the letters given they are written very nicely. Some of the handwritings are excellent. This is these are many questions. There are five questions in this. I asked for one question per person. Hmm? I think we will not deal. Questions I'll read out. Can consciousness conjure up reality? This, what we call reality, is all conjured up by the consciousness. Turiya definition. We discussed this in the morning, the pure witness state, that which witnesses all the three states of consciousness and is not caught up by any of these three states is Turiya. Is Turiya the highest state or is there anything? For this you need to first reach Turiya. Mm, then you will begin to understand if there is something called Turiya Atita. But first the Turiya has to be, it makes no sense to explain that there is a state higher than Turiya without understanding or experiencing Turiya. Turiya cannot be experienced actually. Uh, when all experiencer and the experienced cease to exist, there is Turiya as a pure witness. And while one is fully absorbed in Turiya, when one understands Turiya deeply enough, then comes a state which is called Turiya Dita. It's not a state. 
it is the original consciousness existing in its own quality without any movement. It's also called Sahaja Avastha. This we need not worry. Buddhist cosmology tells us about 31 planes of existence, whereas Yoga Vasistha talks of 14 planes of existence, which is correct. Don't worry too much. About it. Some planes of existence are there. Whether they are 13 or 31, not really, we don't have to worry too much about these little nitty gritty of things. Can prarabdha be annulled and f fully annulled? And to what extent prayaschitta can help? Can prarabdha be yes? Pr prarabdha is like this. It is the effect of your past karma, which even after you have figured it out, continues to stay and will end by its own after a while. You cannot decide. Like, if the fan is on and then you switch it off, right? Normally, if you switch off the fan, immediately the fan should stop. But it won't stop. It will go, go, then become slow and slow and slow and then stop. This is the situation of Prahlapta. Even though you have switched it off, it will continue for some time and stop on its own. Uh, if you have switched it off. So switching off is most important. And that is to realize your inner self. That is the switch off point. That there is one which is always there as witness, it does not change. It remains forever. When this is understood, then prarabdha is switched off. When it's switched off, it still has an effect till it stops by itself. For some it is longer, some it is shorter, depends on the quality of the fan. Hmm? Now there is a fifth one, which is a sensitive topic, but since you have mentioned it, I might, I will look at it. Osho says, Meditation cannot be done by the mind. Yes, it is a state where there is a complete dissolution of the mind. Please explain. Osho says meditation cannot be done. Whether Osho says it or Osho does not say it, I agree with this. That meditation cannot... See, it's like this. The word meditation in English is not an apt word. In the Yoga Shastra, there are three words that describe it. Hmm? Dharana, Dhyana and Samadhi. Now we usually mix up everything, sometimes this, sometimes this and call it meditation. Dharana can be done. Dharana is a conscious process because I am sitting down I'm saying I'm going to fix my one-pointed attention on something. Dharana. Deliberate action. When dharana continues for a long time, without any effort, it becomes dhyana. So dhyana cannot be What probably he meant was it cannot be done by the mind, which means you can do dharana, but when dharana deepens, it automatically changes into dhyana. So you cannot say, I am doing dhyana. You can say, I am doing dharana. Probably this is what he meant. And then from dharana, it moves on automatically into dhyana. Dhyana cannot be a deliberately done state. It is something that happens to you. The moment you see it happen, then it changes. When you continue to be in it, there is no change. There is uniform, blissful, quiet, tranquil existence. This is dhyana. And when dhyana happens, there is a complete dissolution of your individual mind. There is something called the universal mind that still exists. Individual mind goes and you would realize that the individual mind is like a small dot in the midst of space 
the whole space is the whole thing and the individual points where it turns into a whirlpool like structure is what is called the individual mind that dissolves when the whole thing is but when the mind dissolves it does not mean that your consciousness or awareness dissolves when it will be useless right it will be like shushupti nothing you don't know anything about it. it's not shushupti consciousness and its awareness is very much there but its identification with local individuals is lost that's all that may be probably why osho said it i don't know <laughs> wooden box oh, sorry why you must have put something in the wooden this is a little personal question in dwapara yuga you were in a female body How many years ago do you think Dwapara Yuga ended? <coughs> Can you tell me about Yuga Chakra? Now, listen. Let's not go into the female body thing. But uh, Kali Yuga is supposed to start after Krishna's disappearance from this world. That's where Kali Yuga, so Dwapara is over. Hmm. So we are somewhere in the middle of mm, Kali Yuga, that past. Well, there is one theory that we are in Satya Yuga. I don't subscribe to that. From the Shastra's point of view, we have just shifted from the middle of Kali Yuga and are moving forward. Uh, according to my Sonat Baba Ji, this is how it is. He also understood it this way. after many years of half kali yuga half more of that happens then the kali yuga will also end and the next yuga will come i think now is the time to prepare for the next yuga i think this i think i know that people who are spiritually going to regenerate themselves in this yuga are going to appear again in the satya yuga in prominent positions so they can lead the world into a better place So now is the time for us to work. <clears throat> This is what my Sarnath Baba Ji believed in, and what was taught to me. Yeah, does a parent's karma affect us as children? sometimes to protect one's mental health one might have to maintain a distance from one one's parents huh is that bad karma for us i'm not talking about abandoning parents or not looking after them parents karmas have an effect on us we are the result physically of your of our parents karma we are we cannot deny that right we are this result or the product of our parents karma whatever karma they did but that doesn't mean that their karma in their life has any bearing on our karma we are independent beings for some reason which also we can work out of course if you go back and look we have been chosen to be born in this household because of their activity we are born but their karma has nothing to do with our karma our karma is individual hmm? now this thing about maintaining a safe distance from my parents is it bad karma then i must suffer from terrible bad karma <laughs> because i ran away from home for the reason that i wanted to keep my mind off from what they were thinking uh and but you whoever wrote this seems to be a good person you're not abandoning your parents you're still looking after them but you want to distance yourself from their mental world you don't want to think as they think which is fine which is how it should be you don't have to think exactly but then 
you will have to look after them if they have nobody else to be looked after because it will become a big black mark on your karmic process if you don't that doesn't mean you should agree with everything that they say and your belief system may not need not be tailored to suit their belief system not required but for giving birth to you you need to take care of them unless you want to become a sannyasi then sannyasi has no links to the family this somebody desperately wrote please pick up an answer <laughs> what if i start working on this question it will take another satsang one to hours um so i don't think we can deal with it now at the moment i'm so sorry but i will read the question to make you understand that i am i am aware of what you're trying to say in one of your videos you said your best moment with baba ji was when he said now you know what was it that you knew <laughs> how can i experience what you have what i have Wonderful, very sincere question, of course. Please, it requires a big answer. Please explain about what it meant in the Kathopanishad, Kathopanishad, when Yama said to Nachiketas that what you are looking for is Aditi. It is the fire. It is this world. In this world, it can be seen as seeing in a mirror. how to experience truth what can be seen in the mirror i'm not going to explain the whole thing go back to the kathopanishad but in the mirror you see what you see is a lateral image of yourself to see yourself means to see yourself without a mirror mirror is a reflection of your face of your body but that is only a reflection it is not the real you while you are looking at the mirror you imagine that you are there in the mirror but if the mirror breaks nothing is happening to you so a mirror is an image what you see not yourself when you understand this then you understand the self is different from the image that is projected one the second is that I see all of you because I have eyes, right? But I cannot see my own eyes. My eyes cannot see my own eyes. You will say, "Oh, I can see it in the mirror." That is a reflection. It's an image, but not my eye. It is a reflection of my eye. But the eye cannot see itself. But I know it exists because without it, I cannot see the world. The inner self is somewhat like that metaphor. it is the inner self that sees everything but it cannot see itself because it sees everything we know that it is existing so in nama says to nachiketas you are looking for is aditi aditi means the first that from where everything started that's what it means the essence of yourself the point from where the mind started differentiating into different thoughts the seed source of all thoughts is aditi it is in the fire yeah fire is a perfect symbol of aditi because it burns everything to ashes and purifies everything and then slowly turns itself off from one fire you can light a hundred fires without diminishing the fire so it is a symbol of the spirit okay so we'll have to call it today i was enjoying the whole thing actually but uh, because i don't come prepared i deal with things as they come 
So when people ask genuine spiritual questions, I am quite happy actually. But there is also this watch time, right, which you have to follow. I have a couple of other things lined up after this. So I need to go. We started at 5. It's already 6.30 almost. Thank you very much for the satsang and uh, Om Shanti 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 Hari Hari.